Hello and welcome to a special video for my Physics 1102 Fundamentals of Physics 2 class uh, to show a demonstration of one of my favorite demonstrations I like to give in the, in the classroom, um, but rendered in a digital environment. So this video is about um, cosmology and astrophysics, and in particular we've been talking about the development of ideas and our understanding of gravitation and how it works. And um, in our lectures in first year physics, I have tried to introduce some concepts from general relativity without the mathematics. Now, I've kind of hinted to the class that the mathematics involved in general relativity is actually quite complicated. And this is the definitive textbook on the subject, right? One massive book all on gravitation and if you look at content within it, the mathematics within it is actually quite horrendous and it's based on these mathematical devices called tensors, which are, um, if you like, just to give you a flavor for what they are, we have scalars, which are just numbers, like the temperature is a scalar. We have vectors, which are um, three-dimensional, usually spatial um, vectors that uh, we use to describe a size of something and a direction in which it's pointing. And then we have matrices, which are um, multiple vectors, if you like, together. And if you can imagine a matrix of matrices, then we're starting to talk about things that are in the realm of tensors. And tensors are even more generalizable than that. So you can have matrices of matrices of matrices of matrices, and they would all fall under the general term of tensors in the same way that one, two, few, many, um, scalar, vector, matrix, tensors. So the mathematics is quite horrendous. Um, it is really fascinating when you get the tools you need to be able to engage with it and do it. And general relativity is actually a really elegant theory in its own right. Um, but in our first year lectures, we were talking about Einstein and this notion of curvature of the space-time continuum by matter. Now, in, in the demonstration I want to show you is talking about a curved space as opposed to a flat space. You're familiar with flat spaces because since you were in primary school and talking about mathematics and, and so forth, you would start with a piece of paper and the piece of paper is considered to be a flat space. This is a flat piece of paper, right? Flat space. And in our three-dimensional coordinate system that you do in coordinate geometry and calculus and so forth, we use Cartesian coordinates which are orthogonal to one another. We have an X and a Y and a Z, an I, J, K, and I cross J is K. They're perpendicular to each other. But if, if you have curved spaces, their properties change from the properties that we've come to know and love. To demonstrate this, here's a curved space I've prepared earlier. So we know this is curved, um, and we also know from you know studying the globe and um, the different projections of cartographers over the centuries of maps of the land on the Earth that there's distortion of the extremes in the corners or the top and the bottom of the map when you have the mollyweed projection of the atlas, which is flat. Um, and so you see things like Greenland, which are much, much larger on the flat map of the world that we know quite well and use routinely now, compared to what it actually is if you see it on an actual globe. All right, so that's an artifact of the curvature versus the flat space. And of course, if I take my piece of paper and I try to curve it, the best I can do in curving a piece of paper is to make a cylinder. All right, I can't turn it into a sphere. I can only curve it, and I'm sorry, it's got folds in it. Um, I can only curve it around so that it might be curved in one dimension. It's curved in this dimension, but it's flat along the edge. So I can't take a flat space and turn it into a curved space unless I map that space or distort that space. Okay, so um, I'm probably not telling you anything new. Here is a balloon. Um, it's a great example of a positive curvature surface. And so the first question I have for you is, 
If you're an ant, so let's draw an ant. Um, if you're an ant on the surface of this particular curved space, like so, how would you know that you're on a curved space rather than a flat one? So there's lots of ways of doing that. Um, if we get our little ant to draw a triangle, like so, what's the sum of the angles of the triangle? I mean, now you know what the answer is. It's 180 degrees, right? Um, for the sum of those angles. 180 degrees, all right? Um, I know you've learned that. You've learned that many, many times. Let me draw a triangle on the surface of this particular curved space. So I'm going to make this one of my points, and I'll make this one of my points, and I'll make... Um, so let's draw that, that first. I should have got a better pen, of course. Uh, right, so here is a triangle I've drawn on our sphere, okay? And of course, this, the thing that's really cool about this triangle is have a look at the angle. What do you think the angle there might be? on the end of that triangle, in that corner. It's supposed to be a right angle, so I've tried to draw it so it is a right angle. There's a right angle, and if we go along uh, one of these sides of the triangle and we get to the other one, that's also a right angle. And if we follow it all the way to the third one, there's another right angle. So here is a triangle that has three right angles in the corners. So it's an equilateral triangle with three times 90, which is not 180 degrees, actually. It's a 270 degree triangle. And so this triangle is actually called a spherical triangle. And because it's a curved surface, the sum of the angles is not 180 degrees. It's more than 180 degrees. And the bigger we draw that triangle, the larger the total angles will be. And why does that happen? Why do we, on the surface of the Earth, when we draw a triangle, get 180 degrees, when in fact the Earth is a curved surface? And the answer is because even though this has a curvature and a curved um, surface on the global scale of the whole balloon, on a local scale, where the ant is, on a local scale, on a small scale, this is approximately flat and flat triangles have an angle, is, the sum of the angles is 180 degrees. So that's one way, first of all, to tell whether you live in a curved space or a flat one. And this was in fact something of great fascination. Um, you, you know, I'm sure you know about the Flat Earth Society. There was a guy earlier this year who was determined to show and prove that the Earth was flat by taking a balloon ride to space and in fact, the balloon burst and he plummeted to his death. So um, I'm sure he learned that it was curved before he died. But um, this notion of a curved Earth has not been something that's relatively recent in the history of humans on the planet. Actually, if you go back to the ancient Greeks, Eratosthenes was the first person to actually not only demonstrate it, but actually measure the curvature of the Earth. He measured the radius of the Earth back in six seven hundred BC I think it was. And if you do more physics when you get to honors level, one of the topics that I teach is cosmology and we get stuck into some deeper things like that. Okay, so curved surface, there's actually another way that we can show that we live in a curved surface. Um, there's a theorem called the parallel transport theorem. So take the ant for example the ant can can pick a direction and say, this is my reference direction. I'm going to call this direction up or north or whatever it is. And on the triangle shown here, if the ant decides to take a path, a walk around the, the circumference of that triangle, um, and all the while 
keeping track of a direction which it's going to call north, for example. So let's choose a direction. It's easier to choose it along one of the sides of the triangle. So let's say the ant calls this direction its reference direction. All right, so we'll say the ant's calling that north for the coordinates and where it is. And so if it starts at this point here, all the while pointing in the same direction, and it walks around the triangle back to where it came from, as it goes, it'll point and go that way, point that way, point this way, point this way, as it goes along the first side. Then when it's going down the second side, point this way, point this way, point this way, gets to the corner, still pointing the same direction. Then it goes back along the bottom, pointing this way, so across the triangle, back this way, back this way. And when it gets back where it started, the arrow is pointing in the same direction it was when it started. So this direction, this absolute direction, applies. And what we've done is we've chosen a reference direction, a vector, pointing northwards in this case, according to the ant. And when it goes around the whole triangle, north is always north. Um, that's, I'm sure we also have learned that from um, everything that we've done and we've got north on the planet. But now let's consider what happens if the ant does the same thing on our big spherical triangle. So let's start at this point here, this corner, and let's go for a walk around the triangle, picking a direction and sticking with the same direction. So we'll draw this direction. Actually, I'm going to change pens. No. Sorry about that. All right. Let's draw an arrow this way and call that our reference direction. So we're going to go for a walk around the triangle, going to always point the same direction and we're going to keep doing it by pointing parallel rays in the same direction. So we're going to walk this way around the triangle and we've got this direction, this direction, this direction. I'm making them all roughly perpendicular to the path. This direction, keep making sure we draw parallel arrows to the one right next to it as we're moving along. And we get to the end of the first side and it looks like this. So we start here, we walk along that side, we get to the end and we've got arrows pointing that direction. So that's our reference direction, that's where we are. Now we're going to walk down this side, this way, and we're going to do the same thing. So as we move along, we've got an arrow pointing this way, so it's pointing upwards towards the corner. Another arrow here towards the corner, towards the corner, towards the corner, towards the corner. We get to the end, so there it is. So there's that side, and we're going down. This was meant to point the direction of the path, not the direction of the arrow, so it's pointing upwards. Pointing up, pointing up, pointing up. We get to the bottom, and we're here. We've got one more side to walk along. So let's walk along the, the last side, um, along here, and do the same thing again. So now, this way is up, this way is up, this way is up this ways up and of course when we get back to the end of where we started from they're all going to point the same direction as we started because we learned that from the little triangle next to the ant helps if I can draw a straight line who'd have thought that was uh, challenging and so we've done this last part so might as well just quickly go over the whole lot again started here and um, off we go Traveling along, always pointing in the same direction as we're moving around the triangle, pointing upwards, 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 upwards. And then when we get back to the start, uh-oh, do you notice that we originally started pointing this way? And when we get back, we're pointing this way, thinking it's the same direction as the direction we started. So there's an extra 90 degrees, and that extra 90 degrees is the extra 90 degrees in the triangle in the internal sum of the angles. But what does this mean? This means that in a curved space, 
You can't define an arbitrary direction of your choosing, call it X say, and expect that it's always going to be pointing in the same direction. All right, boom, that should blow your mind. It blew my mind when I first learned it, and I learned it in third year um, in a, a subject called differential geometry. So when we're talking about things like spaces and curvature, the branch of mathematics that deals with it is called differential geometry. Uh, and it gets more complex with things like ca calculus on manifolds and topology. But the, di the, I the difference between the way in which you deal with this is we don't use a set of Cartesian coordinates um, if we're dealing in this curved space. Instead, we can have local coordinates, so we can define a set of coordinates around a small area, a local set of x, y, and z. But if we do that at every point on the surface, the three vectors won't be pointing in the same direction for the person on this corner of the triangle as it is for the person on this corner of the triangle. Uh, the consequence of the parallel transport theorem, which basically says in a curved space you can't use a parallel transport of a direction and expect it to be pointing in the same direction when you get back to where you started, what that means is in a curved, closed universe, this is a closed space, um, it's a positive curvature space, the same thing happens for a negative curvature space, and I challenge you to go and look up what happens to the sum of the angles in a triangle in a negatively curved space. But the point is, you can't, you can come back to where you started from. So if we, in the four-dimensional space-time continuum, if it's closed and it's curved and we get in a spaceship and we head off in a certain direction, we will eventually come back to where we started from. No matter which path we take, we'll eventually come back to where we started. But when we get there, we will not be able to orient ourselves and even recognize that we're in the same place we started from. That's a big deal, okay? That means that you're beaten before you start because you can't arbitrarily go, what about this, this way, this way, this way, this way. Um, I suppose the counter argument might be the arrangement of the stars in the area. So we would recognize our constellations and so forth. But in the absence of external markers to identify where we are, and that would that's basically saying in, an, in a bigger coordinate system than the one we're in, if we're constrained within the system, we can't tell when we get back to where we started from. Um, this corner. We can't tell when we get back to there unless we have another way of telling. So the ant can tell whether it's on a curved space or not basically by applying methods like this. Okay, and that's the end of my demonstration.